learning from experts across the ocean. Welcome to Voice of the Sea. In this episode, we explore how a changing ocean is impacting the island nation of Palau. We'll meet local fishermen, scientists, community leaders, and the president. We'll talk about the battle they face between overfishing and conservation amid sea level rise and increasing demand for food. Palau's environmental challenges have implications for coastal and inland communities across the globe. Its unique placement in the Indo-West Pacific creates an environment with both an amazing diversity of species and an abundance of biomass. Scuba enthusiasts, fishermen, and scientists travel from around the world to experience the beauty of Palau's aquatic environment. I first visited Palau in 2005 and I was excited to return. On this trip, I had the chance to speak with fishermen and community leaders about the effects of climate change and fishing pressures on Palau's natural resources. These people explained how the Palauans' way of life is threatened by reduced catch, sea level rise, and the difficulties of creating sustainable tourism. Although the Palauan fishermen understand that they must conserve, they still need to provide for their families. I talk to people across Palau to better understand the situation. Ridyal, you're a fisherman here in Palau. Mm -hmm. What kind of fishing do you do? Okay, I prefer spearfishing, diving, and uh, we do a lot of that here. But, and it's been a lot of fun, and uh, I get a lot of fish from doing that, yeah. Do you spearfish with a scuba tank, or do you free dive? Oh no, uh, we, I free dive. Uh, scuba, using scuba gear is illegal here in Palau, so. Why is yeah. fishing by scuba illegal? It's kind of been our, our I think the locals uh, realized that it would, it would uh, completely like, we don't want to over harvest our, our fish, so we, we kind of just limited ourselves. And it's actually a law, so we, everybody follow, most everybody follows it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So that must make it um, more difficult to catch the fish. It kind of yes. puts you on a more evil, even footing with mm -hmm. the fish. Yes, yes. One, one man against one fish. No <laughs> gear. <laughs> yeah. um, how did you learn how to spearfish? Well, uh, my family and my father, they were always spearfishing when I was growing up. And uh, they did all kinds of fishing. And uh, I just kind of gravitated towards spearfishing more. I, I'm not really into bottom fishing with, with fishing line and stuff. But it's, it's another experience, but I, I prefer spearfishing. What's the hardest thing, do you think, about spearfishing? Uh, spear, the hardest thing about spearfishing? Uh, well, it requires a lot of uh, stamina to be able to swim all day. And uh, there's no one really hard thing about it. You, know, you got you to gotta be able to fool the fish. You got to be able to hold your breath long enough. And, uh, you know, it's, it's one man against one fish at, at a time. <laughs> Can you explain to me what you mean about fooling the fish? Uh, well, you, they're not going to let you swim right up to them and catch them. They, they, you're going to have to go around some rocks and wait for them to come, get curious and come towards you. And that's when you get your shot. Uh, and uh, I prefer spearfishing too because it's it's uh, it's really selective, and uh, you know you, you choose your fish one at a time. There's a little bit of there's no bycatch at all. So what's bycatch? By uh, like net fishing, you catch fish that you can't sell in the market, or fish that are you know that you you can't eat. Uh, and uh, spearfishing, you choose every single fish you catch. So that must mean you also need to know a lot about the fish that you're trying to spear if you're mm -hmm. maybe where they live or what their uh, behavior is like? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. And how did you learn that? Uh, that's just been passed down from generation to generation and a, a lot of uh, direct uh, spearfishing on my own. Yeah. So you go out and fish and you observe mm -hmm. what the fish are doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the spawning cycles, the aggregation areas, and all, and you learn that. You learn uh, from going, doing, going out yourself, but also a lot of it has been taught and handed down from, uh, from uh, our family members. Are there any regulations or rules about when you can fish for certain um, types of fish? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, there are. Um, 
there are certain species that are completely protected and now the grouper species is, is out of season. I think it's going to be out of season for, it's going to be protected for the next 90 days, I think it is. And, and it comes around in 90 day intervals, 90 days on, 90 days off, or if I'm not mistaken. I might, I might be have that a little bit off, but there are cycles to it. Mm -hmm. um, and how do you feel about those restrictions? Uh, I think it's a good thing. It's a good thing, uh, but there are some species that are have a total. Uh, they're completely protected, and there's and they don't have an open season for. And I, I think that that may be the wrong approach. I, I think that they should allow some time, maybe a few months out of the year, for us to be able to catch those. But right now, they're completely protected. A couple of species are. And do the fishermen here in Palau work with the conservation folks and the management authorities to determine um, when the fish are in season and when they're out of season? You know what, I don't think there's any, you mean actual fishermen helping, helping out with the studies and stuff? Yeah. I don't think that's actually going on. Just, I think they're just going by playing it by heart and seeing uh, just to see what works. And. Uh, but I think we should incorporate more science in, with the fishermen and get their input too. What's your favorite kind of fish to hunt? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good question. I, well, there's a local fish, the unicorn fish, that I really like. And uh, but then I also like to go for the pelagics, the, uh, the uh, Spanish mackerels and the dog tooth tuna. And, uh, also grouper. When it was in season, I, I caught a nice size grouper just a few months ago. And what is maybe your favorite thing about the hunting of the fish? Is the hunt. <laughs> <laughs> Fooling them and getting, getting close enough to get that one shot. Uh, that's and my... Do you practice holding your breath? Yes, definitely. Definitely. That's, it's, that's, uh, uh, yeah, that's one thing that you really need to practice when it comes to spearfishing. Because uh, the longer you hold your breath, the better your chances are. Mm. And Landing. when you talk about, like, you learn from your parents and your relatives, um, are you teaching anybody now to <laughs> fish? Uh, no, I, I got a few nephews that uh, are interested, and I think they're going to be the next generation. So we need to make time for them and take them out a couple times. Yeah changes that he's seen. Oh yeah. So growing up here in Palau, have you noticed any changes in the, the assemblage of fish or in the ability to catch fish over time? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, when I was younger, my father would go out and come back in just a day and catch so much fish, like several coolers full of fish and have fish for all of the family and some of the extended family. And today, uh, when I go out, I myself, I can't even fill up one, one cooler. Well, I mean, there are days, there are good days, but most of the time I don't even fill up a whole cooler by myself. And why do you think that is? Uh, overfishing, maybe a little bit of the climate change effects. I'm not so sure how that... I'm, I hear that that may be causing some of it and some of the uh, pollution and the erosion from uh, road constructions and stuff. So, uh, a little bit of everything, I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. um, Palau is pretty uh, progressive in terms of the monitoring and also the conservation efforts. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that that might help the fish population to recover here? Yes, definitely. But, uh, but whatever science that we want to implement, it really should, it should have the full support of the fish, local fishermen. If it doesn't, and then the fishing, at least the fishermen won't be able to, you know, uh, help out effectively in, that, in mm -hmm. that strategy. And I think that as fishermen, you, would you consider yourself a, a scientist about mm -hmm. the fish? So, um, yeah, somewhat, because we do know a lot of information about the fish, and we can contribute to, to the science, yeah. I think so, too. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Some fishermen might say that they have a right to fish, that no matter what the regulation says, that mm -hmm. um, they grew up fishing, okay. their families fish, they, they have this right to fish. But what I hear from many fishermen in Palau that I've talked to is that 
they understand why there might be a regulation mm -hmm. um, or a, a bull where mm -hmm. there's a, a no take for a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's in Palawan culture to really, to just take what you need. So in, uh, help uh, incorporating the fishermen with the conservation efforts, I don't think it's going to be that much of a struggle because it's already ingrained in our culture that we're supposed to just take what we need. And, and this new fish market co uh, concept is, it wasn't really in our culture in the past. You know, you just go out, you take what you need, and if you take any more than that, you'll get in trouble by the local uh, the elders. And if, if any fish goes to wait, and that's kind of in our culture. So, so I, I'm thinking that the fishermen won't have a problem uh, here in Palau at least with the conservation efforts and just as long as I think they need to be informed and they need to be involved in the process and, and, the, and, uh, and the deliberation and all, and all the lawmaking uh, issues that come with it. To have a voice. To have a voice in it, yes. Have you traveled outside of Palau yes, at I, all? Yes, I have. Uh, quite um, a bit. Quite a bit. And do you notice anything like that Palau is doing that other places in the Pacific might be able to learn from practices here in Palau? Wow, that's a deep question. <laughs> um, that Palau is doing that we could uh, help, uh, that other people can do? Well, I, uh, I think we're fortunate to be a small enough country where all our lawmakers are really in, uh, involved in their communities. So the, the conservation efforts, as, as far as making laws, is already incorporating the f local fishermen. Like a couple of the people back at the fish market there are senators. So, so you, you know, they, they really take everybody's input. And I think it's a, it's a blessing that uh, our lawmakers can, can be in the community, actually from the communities and, and uh, interacting with the fishermen and, and so that they know what, at least what the fishermen are thinking. So in that sense, they're uh, taking the, they're, the fishermen are con contributing to the lawmaking process. But there's no actual formal, uh, formal collection of information or involvement of the fishermen that I know of, at least. Uh, but uh, yeah, if, if uh, other people can learn from it, is yeah, the lawmakers need to get into the communities and the fishing communities especially and get their input. <laughs>
helping coastal communities of Hawaii and the Pacific through research, education, and outreach. Serving the community, from elementary to graduate students. Hawaii Seagram.